felt where in the past minute that I was being introduced, 100 hours of video was uploaded to YouTube. 500 million tweets are sent per day. 1.4 million books are written per year. In a world like that, it is increasingly difficult to stand out. And yet, if we are going to succeed professionally, if you are going to get your true talents known and seen and recognized so that you get the promotion, so that you get the raise, so that you get the venture funding, we somehow have to stand out. Over the course of the past couple of years, I interviewed more than 50 top thought leaders, the world's experts in a variety of different fields, from business and technology to genomics and urban planning, to try to understand what the common denominator was in terms of what made them successful. What was it about them that enabled them to develop breakthrough ideas and perhaps even more importantly, get recognized for those ideas by others? So one of the things that I learned, one of the, the interviews that perhaps st stands with me and, and sticks out the most is one that I did with David Allen. And that's somebody that perhaps some of you are familiar with. He is the productivity expert who is best known for uh, the blockbuster bestseller, Getting Things Done. And when I spoke with him, he had something pretty interesting to say, which is that it doesn't take time to have great ideas, it takes space. So often, that is what's lacking for us in today's society, white space. How many of you spend your days with back-to-back -back meetings and phone calls shuttling around? How many of you, even if you're not in a meeting, are still thinking about what you should have said in the meeting? <laughs> or about how to prepare for the next one? Yesterday, I had 10, as a matter of fact, so I can relate. But one of the things that I am starting to try to do differently as a result of writing this book is to carve out more white space, because that is where ideas can grow and percolate. I also interviewed Teresa Amabile, who is a Harvard Business School professor and an expert on creativity. She did a fascinating study about multitasking. And you know, we all probably know a lot of people who, uh, you know, I mean, we, we hear sometimes, oh yeah, multitasking, it's so difficult. You, you take your eye off the ball, you lose your productivity, et cetera, et cetera. But there's always a few people that say, oh, I thrive on multitasking. I'm better when I multitask. I am firing on all cylinders. And so they did a study to actually look at those people. What are they doing differently? What is it that enables them to optimize their performance in this, in this hectic, hurly-burly world? Is there something that we can learn from the people who are so good, who, who seem to thrive on doing 10 things at once? What they learned is that those people are deluded. <laughs> they, too, had massive performance drop-offs they just didn't know it. <laughs> we need to focus on what matters most. But how do you do it? How do you come up with the breakthrough ideas that you can become known for, that can become a signature of what you do? One of the people that I profiled was this woman. Her name is Rose Schumann. Rose grew up in the suburbs of DC. And when she was a teenager, her family visited Nicaragua, because that was where her stepmother was from. And they took this family trip, and it was shortly after the end of the Contra War. And when she got down there, the country was still in absolute disarray. There was one functioning streetlight in the country. The institutions that Rose had known all her life, that she had thought of as, as the bedrock of the way that a country was run, were absolutely not present in Nicaragua. And it troubled her. She didn't know what to make of it as a teenager to see this disparity in her own life, in the life of the relatives of her stepmother. And so she vowed she wanted to do something about it. She wanted to try to change things. And 
In fact, she did. She went to school for international development. When she graduated, she got a job working at an NGO. But one of the most interesting things happened a few years after that. She was walking around her city, like a lot of us do some days, and she saw something that she had seen probably a million times, but she'd never really noticed it before. She'd never really thought about it before. And that was a call box, kind of like you'd, you'd see at a transit station. Push a button, talk to somebody. And all of a sudden, it hit her. This problem that she had been thinking about for years, that she had been trying to solve, how do you bring internet access to the world's poorest people? She realized that in some ways the answer had been staring her in the face. A lot of people think about laptops, right? How do we, how do we give laptops to the poor? And that's a great idea. But for the poorest billion people, they may not have a safe place to store a laptop. They may not be literate. They're almost certainly not literate in a language that exists on the internet. How do you help those people? Rose realized that a call box might be the answer. She spent a feverish four hours sketching out ideas in her notebook. And she spent the next decade actualizing her vision. She called it Question Box. And today, it operates throughout India and Africa. And the way that it works is that in a rural village, they will put a call box, a question box. And you can go up to it, push a button, and ask a question. And on the other end, you're connected to someone in a centralized location with a computer who will Google the answers for you. <laughs> this never would have happened if Rose hadn't taken her family trip to Nicaragua, if she hadn't felt that spark and started to care based on her own experience. Sometimes when we think, how do I find my idea? How do I find the difference that I'm going to make, the thing that I'm going to be known for? We try to, we try to think, well, what, you know, what, is, what does my audience want? How do I survey them? How do I figure out what holes there are in the market? How do I do you know, a gap analysis? That's important. It's all important. But sometimes the best starting place is to think about your own experiences, to think about what has touched you, what has moved you, and the difference that you want to make. But of course, having the idea is only half the battle. As I was researching Standout, one of the things that I learned again and again is that if you are going to be a thought leader, a recognized expert in your company or in your industry, there's really two pieces to that puzzle. The thought part is that you have to get known for your ideas. You have to have ideas, to borrow the phrase from Ted, that are worth spreading. But to be a thought leader, you have to have followers. You have to be willing to roll up your sleeves and share your ideas to evangelize, to make sure that people know them and have heard them. These days, it's easier than ever. There's no excuse. We know we're all busy. This is a, a piece that I did a couple of years ago for the Harvard Business Review. If you're serious about ideas, get serious about blogging. Now, you guys are a technically sophisticated audience. You're probably all periscoping and blabbing right this minute. <laughs> Those are good, for sure. They have their place. But I want to I wanna argue, I want to make a case that blogs, the least sexy thing in the room, you know, oh, it's so 2003. <laughs> I would argue that blogs are still one of the very best ways to establish thought leadership. Because you want, you know, yes, it takes skill to be good at doing a Periscope video. I think it takes even more skill to make a sustained 700, 800 word argument and to do it again and again and to show people how your mind works, to make manifest what your knowledge is that too many of us hold inside. I'll give you an example of what that looks like. This is someone that I was 
particularly proud to include in my book because he's actually a former employee of mine. Uh, he lives in Brooklyn now. His, ma his name is Mike Lydon. And Mike, years ago, before I, before I started my business, before I started consulting, I was the executive director of a bicycling advocacy nonprofit. <laughs> and Mike was my staffer. He was the very first person I hired. And Mike stayed with me for a year, and then he went off to graduate school. I was very, very sad, but I understood because we only paid him $24,000. <laughs> but Mike had a vision for himself, even then. He went off to graduate school in urban planning. And he knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to be an urban planner. He wanted to make transit more accessible. And so that's, that's what he did. He, he got into a great program. He spent a few years working at one of the preeminent firms in the nation. And he decided in 2009 to open his own firm. The only problem with this idea is that if you remember anything about 2009, it's probably that it was not the greatest time to start your own firm. <laughs> especially in a business that is dependent on the government giving you money. But that's what Mike did anyway. He started his firm, and he knew that the gravy train of large government contracts was not going to be lasting forever. In fact, it wasn't even operating then. And so he had to find a way somehow to distinguish himself rapidly. Mike had become fascinated with something that he kept seeing flare up, little, little case studies. He, he wasn't sure really what to make of it at first. But basically, it was citizens doing DIY, DIY urban planning. Things like the creation of parklets. I don't know if you guys have, have seen these, uh, especially in San Francisco. They take parking spaces and they reclaim them and turn them into parks. They have benches and grass and things like that. He saw examples of citizens in different parts of the country painting their own bike lanes when the government was too slow doing it. He saw examples of citizens taking boarded up storefronts and painting murals on them. He began to say there was a pattern, and he called it tactical urbanism. He decided to start gathering the case studies and he gathered more and more and more, and eventually he had enough for a book. And so he didn't do anything fancy with it. He put them all together, he created a PDF, and he put it on his website for free. But something interesting started to happen. Within a few months, 10,000 people had downloaded his PDF, which in a world like urban planning is enormous. <laughs> so he started to get some positive feedback. And so he gathered even more case studies. And he put up Tactical Urbanism Volume 2. More people became interested. More people started pinging him. A firm in South America wrote to him and said, this is amazing. Can we collaborate and do a volume with Latin American case studies? And he said, yes. And he put that up on their website. Over the course of five years, the three volumes, the three free volumes he put on his website have now been downloaded 160,000 times. And Mike built his business on the strength of the tactical urbanism brand. He now receives on a regular basis government RFPs specifically requesting firms to apply that have experience in tactical urbanism. And he invented the term. It doesn't take a lot to share your ideas. It doesn't take money now, even. The gatekeepers are gone. It can be a PDF on your website, but if you're willing to share your ideas, that can make a difference in establishing you as a thought leader. What else? What else do we need in order to really advance and get known in our field, in our industry, as a recognized expert, how to stand out? One of the things that's most important I discovered in the course of writing my book, which you guys will actually be receiving a copy, thanks to App Nexus in your, in your gift bags. Woo! Go App Nexus. <laughs> 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 but one of the things that, that you really need is a team of close-knit supporters. 
And that was something that I, I learned about when I spoke to this woman, Hank Philippi Ryan. She was somebody I actually profiled in my first book called Reinventing You. Hank, for many years, and in fact still is, a very successful TV news reporter in Boston. And she had a woman who was an intern. And this intern was somebody that, that just loved Hank. It was her dream one day to come back and get a job and be Hank's producer. And it was kind of a lofty goal for a college student uh, to, to want to be a producer at a you know, major television station. But she was persistent. And you, after you know, getting her experience in the field, years later she came back and she actually did it. She actually got the job. But in the interim, while she was gone, she'd taken up a hobby. And that was writing romance novels. And so one day she says to Hank, Hank, I'm trying to get this novel published. Would you be willing to read it and offer feedback? And Hank said, oh, of course, of course. So she takes the book. She starts reading her former intern's romance novel. And something hits her. She said, it's like the Zen saying, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Hank realized she had always wanted to write a book, but she had never done it. She had never taken the time. She had never carved out the space. She had never made the effort. And finally she said, if my intern can do it, I can do it. And she started writing. Today, this is one of Hank's books. She has more than half a dozen and has won almost every award in the mystery genre, which is her genre of choice. We should not be waiting and, and relying on the idea of just some perfect senior person to be our mentor. The truth is there are not enough of them. What we need to start doing is taking it in our own hands and realizing we need a mentor board of directors. It doesn't matter if they're older, if they're your peers, if they are your intern. We can be learning specific skills and getting inspiration from all the people around us. Your mentors may surprise you. A few other quick tips for you about how to develop a reputation as an expert in your field and stand out. One comes from Ronald Burt, who is a sociologist at the University of Chicago. He said that uh, he, he basically studies networks and how essentially to make yourself indispensable in a network. His tip is that what you should be doing, you've got to be the person in the center. You've got to be the hub rather than the people at the spokes. And what does that mean in practical terms? What it means is that too often organizations are siloed. There are people who should be talking to each other who are not. If you can be the person who is the bridge, if you're the person who's reaching out, who's having lunch with people who's willing to have coffee, who's talking to people in the hallways, if you refuse to follow the, the human path of least resistance of only talking to the people whose offices are next to yours or the people on your team, if you are willing to be the bridge, you will make yourself invaluable because you know things other people don't. And if you spread that wisdom, people will say you are indispensable. What else? I hear a lot from people that when it comes to building these networks, they, uh, they sometimes are nervous about it because they say, oh, Dory, but yeah, yeah, I'm an introvert. Well, I want to say I am an introvert, and, I, and so here's my life hack that I'd like to share with you. I get nervous at big cocktail parties and things like that. I do not like walking into a room where I don't know anyone. But something that I realized, you can't opt out of networking, but you can make it work for you. I have a lot of dinner parties. And if you get a small group of people together, if you do networking on your terms, whatever that is, whether it's inviting people over for a barbecue, if it's doing an activity together, if it's going on a walk with them, whatever it is, but if you're doing it in a way that you feel comfortable, it makes it easier and better for you. Now, I, as a point of pride, I always try to have a Top Gun slide in my <laughs> presentations. <laughs> really quickly, this comes from a couple of researchers I love, Jeffrey Pfeffer at Stanford, Robert Cialdini at Arizona State. What they discovered is that oftentimes 
if you have a wingman, if you have someone who is your friend, who is able, they are able to get away with saying things about you that you can't say on your own. It might be bragging if you say it, but if they say it, it's just someone enlightening the audience as to your merits. <laughs> so you can start today. If you are here with a buddy or tomorrow when you're back at the office, make a pact. At the next conference, at the next, next networking event, I will talk you up if you talk me up. <laughs> Perfect for people who are nervous about uh, you know, whether their personal branding is going too far because you know what? You don't have to worry about it. You just worry on sh about shining a light on your friend. They will do the same for you. My final piece of advice that I wanted to share for you. How do we do all this when it comes to sharing our thought leadership and getting known? One of the things that, of course, you hear, we're busy people, is how am I going to have time for that? How can I make time in my life? And I want to share with you a quick story. Many of you guys may know this gentleman. You may be more familiar with pictures of him naked in a shower with Google Glass. Uh, it is, of course, Robert Scoble, the uh, technology opinion leader. Um, I interviewed Robert for my book, Stand Out, and he told me something interesting. He, this is a guy, who, of course, he gets hundreds and hundreds, sometimes close to 1,000 emails a day. Absolutely overwhelming. And he says that when people email him with a question, he writes back to them. And he says, I'm happy to answer your question, but not on email. And he says the reason he does it is that if you email someone a question, you have helped one person. He tells them instead to put it on Quora, the question and answer website. And he says, if I put the answer on Quora, I'm able to help five people or 50 people or 500 people. We do not have more than 24 hours in a day. We need to start getting smarter. We need to think about how to scale our efforts, how to do it once and share it with the world. If you want your ideas to have maximum impact, we need to figure out how to make our voices louder, go further with the same amount of effort. If we can scale our ideas, that is where we can start to make a difference. I'm Dory Clark. If you want to continue, hang in. Uh, my, my website is doryclark.com. I have a free workbook, actually, that helps you come up with your own breakthrough ideas. Um, feel free to download it. And as you go through uh, today with the rest of the, the lecture, with the rest of the cocktail party, I hope you will begin to ask, what experiences in your own life can you draw from to find your breakthrough idea? And how can you find ways to share it, to leverage it, and to share your gift and talent with the world. Thank you.